Hello, and welcome to Linear Algebra. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to um, start um, discussing the history and a sort of introduction to what the course will be about. Uh, the logistics of the course, uh, you can find on the course website. So I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Um, let me start sharing. So this will be just introduction. But I will mention that the textbook for the course will be linear algebra by Mekis and Mekis. Okay, so uh, linear systems of equations show up in all areas of science. And their study has a long history, correspondingly. So linear algebra, which as we'll see, studies these linear systems of equations is really relevant everywhere in all future math classes and in all areas of science. This is really the basic language. Even when you're doing more complicated things that are not linear, usually the way we understand them is by approximating them with something linear. So this is really basic for everything that comes later. Okay, so how far back does this go? Really as far back as, as uh, we can um, find. So there's a Babylonian tablet. A clay tablet from around 300 BCE. So uh, Babylonia, or generally Mesopotamia, uh, as you know, the, has a long history of math. So the, the soil there has a lot of clay, and so it doesn't hold water very well, which means if you're gonna have a large group of people living there, you need to uh, figure out things like uh, irrigation and, um, and just water management in general. And that sort of thing is gonna require figuring out some mathematics uh, even before you start thinking about taxes and uh, things like that. Um, also, because it's a lot of clay, it's, um, that's what people would use to write on. So you would have some sort of wet clay, you would have uh, a stylus, and you'd make some wedge marks on it. And then you bake the, the clay so that it hardens and the writing stays. And one great advantage of that for us is that that lasts a really long time. So there have been discoveries of entire libraries in, in Mesopotamia uh, with tablets still intact that we can now read. It's where the Gilgamesh story was found, for example. Um, th th this time, 300 BC, of course, um, is uh, after the um, conquest of Alexander the Great. And so you have the Seleucid Empire ruling this area. But in any case, we have a, a clay tablet and it says roughly, there are two fields. Whose total area is 1800 square yards. One produces grain at a rate of two thirds of a bushel
per square yard, while the other produces grain at a rate of one half of a bushel per square yard. If the total yield is 1,100 bushels, what is the size of each field? OK, so this is the oldest example we have of a linear system in the surviving record, uh, probably. Uh, another source that's uh, ancient and has a linear system comes from China. We don't quite know when it was written. So let's say one of the earliest surviving mathematical texts from China so Ju Sang Xuan Shu or nine chapters on the mathematical art written sometime before the year 263 uh, maybe around 200 BCE Right, so here what happens is that we have um, a version together with commentary from the year 263. And um, this commentary starts by saying that it's actually a much older text, but that the earlier versions were lost um, because of the burning of books, right? So as you probably know, China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, uh, who unified China, started the, the empire, um, is traditionally uh, said to have uh, decided that all books and, and um, knowledge that came from before was suspect and that it should be burnt. Right? That's, that's what you read in uh, Sima Qian in the um, records of the Grand Historian. But of course, that was written during the Han Dynasty. Um, and so uh, you know, the, the source is a little suspect when talking about the previous dynasty. And scholars now think that uh, the, if there was a purge of, of records, it was probably exaggerated in Sima Chan. Um, so that's why we don't know, but there does seem to have been some uh, loss of books. Um, and so we don't know exactly when the nine chapters on the mathematical art was written, but it seems to play a role in Chinese uh, mathematical culture, similar to Euclid's element in uh, the Western uh, mathematical tradition, in that this book uh, was just used as the standard text for the next thousand years, 1,400 years, I think, in this case. In any case, uh, this these nine chapters and contain things like the Pythagorean theorem. But in, for us, the relevant one is the eighth chapter. Which starts with the following problem. Okay, so a combination of three bundles 
of high quality grain, two bundles of medium quality grain, and one bundle of low quality grain. will yield 39 barrels of flour. If we combine two bundles of high quality grain, three bundles of medium quality grain and one bundle of low quality grain, we obtain 34 barrels of flour. Finally, Combining one bundle of high quality grain, two bundles of medium, and three of low, we obtain 26 barrels of flour. How much flour can be obtained from one bundle of each type? Of grain. Okay, so <clears throat> as usual, the word problem can be a bit um, awkward. In modern algebraic notation, we might write this as saying that 3H plus 2M plus 1L is equal to 39, 2H plus 3M plus 1L is 34, and 1H plus 2M plus 3L is equal to 26. And then the problem asks us to find the values of H, M, and L. Okay, so the method we use today to solve these systems called Gaussian elimination in honor of Carl Friedrich Gauss, who lived between 1777 and 1855. is the same method that was used to 
in ancient China. So in this very first, well, one of the very first mathematical works from ancient China, uh, the method that's used to solve it is exactly the same as the one that we'll talk about, Gaussian illumination. In fact, it was discovered uh, a few times before Gauss's name got associated to it. Um, and it's not entirely clear why it was named after Gauss. It could have been because um, the story got mixed up about where it had started, or it could have been just that uh, it was considered prestigious to assign Gauss's name to it because Gauss was um, widely uh, understood to be the greatest mathematician who had ever lived. <clears throat> Continuing with our story though, uh, let's say that eventually, it was understood, it was realized, that it is better to think of a linear system of equations such as this one as a single equation Uh, for a vector, uh, right? So in this case, uh, we would just keep track of the uh, coefficients of the equations. Then we would have this column as the HML. So this column we, we think of as a vector. And then the right-hand sides of the equations we put together into a vector. And so now we have this one single equation where our unknown is a vector. Um, so here, let's say with the coefficients, set up in a rectangular array known as a matrix. So for a while, historically speaking, determinants were seen as the main tool or the main way to study these systems. In fact, the word matrix comes from the Latin word for womb. Uh, this is because James Joseph Sylvester who lived from 1814 to 1897, who introduced the term viewed matrices as the, um, the wombs of determinants. This is just where determinants came from. So uh, Sylvester, interestingly, uh, his name at birth was James Joseph. 
he added the last name Sylvester later. Uh, it's not entirely clear why he did that. He, well, I mean, he was following uh, one of his brothers. It's not entirely clear why the brother did that. Uh, the brother's name was Sylvester Joseph. And uh, perhaps because he was emigrating to the United States and the United States required immigrants to have a first name, middle name, and a last name. Or perhaps because he wanted to, uh, a name that would sound less obviously Jewish because at the time there was a lot of anti-Jewish discrimination in uh, England and uh, the US. Uh, his brother, whose name was Sylvester Joseph, added Sylvester again as a last name. And then uh, James Joseph uh, followed. Uh, being Jewish actually hurt um, Sylvester's career a lot, uh, both in England and in the US where he eventually came on a couple of occasions. He came to uh, join the faculty of the University of Virginia. And then later he came as one of the founding members of the math department at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, but he had a hard time uh, keeping an academic job or finding an appropriate academic job because of anti-Semitism. Um, so after being at the University of Virginia, he went back to England and he worked uh, as uh, an actuary but the job he had required him to have a law degree. So he went back to school and became a lawyer. Uh, while there, he uh, made a very good friend, a great collaborator, um, known as Arthur Cayley. Cayley was an amazing mathematician, extremely prolific. Uh, Cayley's collected works after he died uh, include 967 papers for a mathematician that's huge. Uh, a, a very a strong mathematician might, after a long career, uh, accumulate, say, 300 papers. That's how many Sylvester ended up with, for example. To end up with 967 is really something. Uh, I think the only mathematician who published more was Euler. But in any case, um, Cayley, um, Cayley was a lawyer also because uh, even though he was a great mathematician and recognized as such uh, while in school, he, um, he didn't want to uh, become a minister in the Church of England. And until the 1850s, all professors at uh, Oxford or Cambridge had to be ministers in the Church of England. Maybe it's just Oxford, in any case, they had to be ministers. And he uh, did not want to do that. So he became a lawyer to uh, supplement his income. This, uh, this did change. Uh, this was in the 1840s. And uh, as I mentioned, it was in the 1850s that that changed. And so eventually Cayley did uh, just have a full-time academic position. But it was his friend Cayley that uh, understood that matrices were interesting in their own right. So not just because you could use them to get determinants and figured out how to multiply them and invert them, for example. This led to thinking of a matrix as inducing a map from vectors to vectors. So the thinking of a matrix as being some gadget that takes in a vector and gives you back a vector. And so to the concept of a linear transformation. And hence the subject
of linear algebra. So that's what the class will be about. We will be studying things like uh, matrices and linear transformations, uh, but the motivating problem is going to be solving systems of linear equations and is something we're going to be coming back to with every new concept. It's relating it to solving systems of linear equations. Okay, so we have these two historical examples of systems of linear equations. So let's go ahead and solve them. Let's start with the Babylonian one. So as we solve them, there are a few remarks I wanna make uh, that will be important uh, moving on. Okay, so for the Babylonian question, let's introduce some variables. Let's let X be the area measured in square yards. of the first field. And let's let Y be the area also measured in square yards of the second field. Okay, so the first thing we're told is that the total area is 1800 square yards, which we can write as x plus y is equal to 1800. Okay, so this is a linear equation in two variables and it has infinitely many solutions. Since there's no reason to require that X and Y be integers, All right? So you, you could take a, a fractional number of square yards and so, uh, for any x you give me, I can find a y. So let's notice that although the uh, quote unquote real world situation requires that x be non negative and y be non negative. This is not built into the equation. Uh, so we should just keep this in mind. when interpreting any solutions we find. Also, uh, interestingly, historically, is that the, um, the Chinese texts, these nine chapters on the mathematical arts, use negative numbers, uh, which in, in, um, in the European tradition, uh, negative numbers would not be accepted for a long time still. Okay, now uh, there's, a, there's a good way of thinking about these infinitely many solutions to this single equation. So following Rene Descartes, life from 1596 to 1650, we can draw a picture of the solutions. Uh, 
as a line in the xy plane. And so the x-axis, the y-axis, and this, this line cuts here at 1800 and here at 1800. And any point here corresponds to a solution. So every point in the xy plane corresponds to a pair of areas. Right, so the first coordinate is just the area of first field, while the second coordinate is area of the second field. And so the points on the line correspond to solutions. Our equation. It's a fun story that uh, this notion, analytic geometry, appears as an appendix of one of uh, Descartes' work. So this wasn't what he was focused on. It's a, it's a wonderful work called The Discourse on the Method, where he comes up with uh, a way of establishing knowledge. And he thinks that the way you should establish knowledge is to start by doubting everything so that you don't uh, introduce errors or ambiguities into your reasoning. You should start by doubting everything. This is where he makes his famous assur uh, assertion that uh, when doubting everything, he realized it was necessary that he who was doing the doubting must exist. And so his famous, I think therefore I am. Uh, apparently he was traveling, he was a professional soldier. He was uh, traveling and um, uh, while staying at a hotel, fell into a fever. And in, in his dreams, while he was sick, he came up with the, the method and with analytic geometry and a couple of other things as well uh, related to optics. And, um, and once he was better, he just wrote this all down and published it. Uh, he, um, um, Anyway, he had a very important correspondence with uh, Pierre Fermat on things like this, uh, and from which we get analytic geometry. Okay, perfect. So that's what we know from the first sentence, just knowing that the total is 1800. We have this one linear equation. We have this representation of it uh, geometrically, and we have infinitely many solutions so far. Now, Secondly, we're told that the first field produces grain at a rate of two thirds bushel. per square yard. And the second at a rate of one half and together they yield 1100 bushels. All right, so this we can write as saying that two thirds times X plus one half times Y is equal to 1100. Putting these together, we have a linear system.
of equations, right? So x plus y equal to 1800 and two thirds x plus one half y equal to 1100. And this is easy to solve. So let's start. Unnecessarily, but convenient. Let's start by multiplying the second equation by six to make the constants nicer. Right, so that our system becomes x plus y equals 1800 and 4x plus 3y equal to 6600. Right, importantly, multiplying both sides of the equation by six did not change the solutions. Next, let's subtract three times the first equation from the second equation. And so this will yield on the left, we have just X and on the right, we have 6,600 minus 5,400, which is 1,200, right? So we've found X, we can substitute this Uh, back into the first equation, we get that y is equal to 6. Right, graphically, okay, so graphically, here's the x axis and here's the y axis. So we have, let's say, let's say this line is the first equation, solutions to the first equation. And then uh, the second line is something like this. So this is the, let's see, let's put this here. So this is the first equation. This is the second equation. No, this represents solutions. And then the point where they um, cross is the solution. So thinking about this system as the intersection of two lines. Makes it easy to see that there are three possibilities. Well, let's say that there were three possibilities. Right, either there was gonna be one solution or zero solutions or infinitely many. Right? Because if you have two lines on the plane, then either they will intersect in one point, they won't intersect at all, or they will be the same line and just intersect at all points. Okay, so that's the Babylonian question. Next, let's take a look at the Chinese question. Right, so this one we had already written as a system. So we have 3H plus 2M plus L is 39, 2H plus 3M plus L is 34, and H plus 2M plus 3L 
is 26. So this is also a linear system of equations. In this case, we have three equations with three unknowns, right, which we have labeled H, M, and L. And uh, I will just tell you the solution is H equal to 37 divided by 4, M equal to 17 divided by 4, and L equal to 11 divided by 4. Uh, now, you don't have to take my word for it. So to check this, and this is the point I want to make, we don't need to solve the system. It is enough to plug in and verify. Okay, so the book calls this the rat poison principle. Uh, by which uh, what they say is that um, if you wanna know if something is rat poison, you don't have to like reconstruct it or something, you just have to feed it to a rat. So for example here, in the last equation. So if we were to plug these into the last equation, then the left-hand side becomes 37 over four plus two times 17 over four plus three times 11 over four, right? And as you will note, that is one fourth 37 plus 34 plus 33, which is 104 divided by four, and that is 26 just like we wanted it to be. And the same if you plug it into the first equation or the second equation. So that's how you can check whether or not you have a solution, just plug it in. Uh, here, each equation represents a plane in R3. And these three different planes have intersected in a single point, and we found the coordinates at that point. Okay, so in closing, let's just give the, the general definition. It's exactly what you would expect. In general, a linear system of M equations with n variables over r, the real numbers, is a set of equations of the form a11x1 plus dot 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 a1nxn equals b1, dot, 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 a, m1, x1, plus, dot, 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 a, m, n, x, n, equal to bn, bm. So here with all of the numbers, all of the a, i, j, and the b, k, real numbers, For all I, J, and K. A solution of a linear system is a set of real numbers. Oh, 
Well, maybe let me go ahead and call it a list of real numbers because they, they come in a specific order. C1 through Cn. So just as many as there are variables such that, and so it's the rat poison principle thing. If you put them in instead of the X's, you get the B's. Okay, and the system is linear. So by definition, we've just defined what a linear system is, but let me just say that the system is called linear because the variables are only ever multiplied by a real number or added together. Okay, so to any of the x's, that's all you ever do. You're allowed to multiply them by a real number, you're allowed to add them together. But, um, so for example, we don't have x squared ever. Okay, we'll stop there for today and pick it up there next time.